I think it's very important for us at this juncture uh, to uh, do a detour from our migration, all right? The next part, which is migration to the Prophet Isaiah Salatu was set in, to discuss the opposite of a tawheed, which is, which is shirk. Tawheed, as we have covered, is very important for our lives because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to know him and to worship him alone. And, that, and for that reason, many of the scholars of the past have said that Tawheed is two categories, right? Which is what? Tawheed al-ma'rifah wal ithbat, right? Knowledge and affirmation, knowing who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, affirming his lordship, affirming his names and attributes, and so forth. And that the other side or the other section of Tawheed or category is huh? Tawheed al-qasd wa talab Okay, that is that you single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. All right. The opposite of that tawheed that you have been created for is a shirk. To associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has various manifestations, some of which we have covered. In fact, when Ibn Qayyim talks about al-firar ilallah, firru ilallah, do what? Flee. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does he say? There's a what? A from and a to. So you're fleeing from associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your worship. From calling upon other than Allah to calling upon Allah alone. From relying upon other than Allah to relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And so forth. From trusting and, and hoping in other than Allah and putting that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is the foundation of our deen. No matter how many times you've heard it, it's not enough. The opposite is also true. And that is that shirk is that which either, either depending on what type of shirk we're talking about, either totally contradicts this hijrah, right? Totally nullifies that hijrah, or, or it makes it deficient. Makes it deficient. Tayyip. Why do we put so much emphasis on a shirk? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, In Allah, la yaghfiru an yushraka bi. Wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika ni man yasha. Allah does not forgive that partners be associated with him. But he forgives other than that, that which he wills. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man mata wa huwa yushriku billahi. Wa huwa yushriku billahi niddan. Whoever associates a rival with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dying in that state, then he goes to the hellfire. Look, man, in the Quran, when he is giving his son advice, he says, Ya Bunayya, what? First advice that he gave him. Ya Bunayya, la tushrik billah. Oh my son. Do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya bunayya. La tushrik billah. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam emphasizing the importance of tawheed and therefore showing us how dangerous the opposite is. When he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Yemen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you're going to a people from the people of the scripture. So let the first thing that you call them to be what? And yuwahidullah, the tawheed of Allah, that they single out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. So this issue, and I'm saying this because subhanAllah, there have been over the decades, there have always been certain movements and certain people who have basically uh, labeled others and say all they talk about is shirk and bid'ah and tawheed, and, right? As if this is something negative. This entire book that we're covering is about tawheed and sunnah. By implication, it's talking about what as well? Shirk and bid'ah. Tawheed, la ilaha illallah, sunnah, wa shahadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. Yani our deen revolves around these concepts. Now, it doesn't mean that 
it doesn't mean that there's uh, not a wise way to talk about some of these things, no doubt about it. But to make it look like somebody's doing something wrong because they're talking about Tawheed all the time, when they're talking about shirk all the time, uh, it's just something that we have to be uh, very conscious of and be very careful of not falling into. In fact, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and, and this is just something I, I really want us to put on the side. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran praises the Rabbaniyin, the Rabbaniyin, those are those scholars who do what? They teach sigar al-ilm qabla kibarihi. They teach the small issues before they teach those, those big issues. Unfortunately today, because of these, as you can see, we got shashat all over the place, just screens everywhere. Because anybody can have a platform today, learn it or unlearn it, scholar or not, studied or not, right? Then a lot of information goes out. People have not learned. I don't, and I don't think, I'm not excluding myself from this, but a lot of us just have not learned. How do we process this information overload? There's a lot of information out there. How do we process that? So... Um, this is just the introduction to the fact that many people, uh, several people have asked me uh, in the last 10 days, two weeks, about a particular um, lecture that is online that makes certain claims about shirk. And since we're dealing with a tawheed and that hijrah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and its opposite is shirk. I do not think that it's a waste of time to go on a side journey and deal with this issue to the best of my ability quickly, because again, this is not something that we want to spend too much time on because honestly, when it comes to ibad and shirk and tawheed and sunnah, you have to sit down and learn, right? We, how long did we cut, subhanAllah, just think about this one ayah, ya ayyuhan nas, O mankind, O mankind, worship, worship your Lord who created you and created those before you so that you what? So that you can attain taqwa. Tayyip. Shaykh al Islam answered that in a book. He was asked about that ayah. And asked about ibadah. And he answered that in a book. And what's the name of that book? al Ubudiya. What did it take? 18, 19 lessons or something like that? We just spent on that? What, what I'm saying is we have to study and we can't expect that these things are going to be, you know, uh, become ultimately very clear very quickly. Right? But when certain claims are made about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that information goes out to the public. And people don't know how to process it. And many people just accept it at face value because the person who's speaking is known to be somebody who has studied the deen and, and put time in. And so people accept those claims at face value simply because they don't have the ability themselves to go back. How do, how do I even, where do I begin to study? So when those claims are brought and several people ask me about this issue, I felt like instead of, you know, you have to answer each person individually, uh, that because there's a lot of chatter online and offline about this and tens of thousands, if not more, views, that this is something that we need to deal with. And inshallah ta'ala, it's a teaching moment. It's a teaching moment because we'll learn some things along the way. So what are we going to be talking about? Two major points. And I, and I hope that, inshallah, uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you said the lisani, to make my tongue straight. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, you know, make us from the hudat and muhtadeen, make us from the guided who guide others. And if there's any questions that you have along the way, I will stop, bi idnillahi ta'ala, at about 20 minutes in. And you can ask some questions and then I'll finish bi idnillahi. And if there are any questions, by, I'd ask that you hold them until then. Okay. What is the, what is the issue? The issue is this. There's a claim that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah ta'ala, who died in the year 1206 after the Hijrah, and in 1792. The claim is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab 
is the first person who has understood the shirk of Quraysh to primarily have been in al uluhiyya What does that mean? Uh, and I, I really do. We, we have to break down the claims so we can understand. What is al uluhiyya Worship. So singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. Type and rububiyya is to single him out as the Lord, to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole creator, sustainer, provider, controller, manager of the affairs, right? Now, the reality is, is that many people have deficiencies in both. The claim here, and we, we, can, we can put it here on the, uh, on the screen. The claim is, that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was the first to say that the shirk of Quraysh was primarily, almost exclusively in Uluhiyah. These are not my words, and I don't want to be looked at as, you know, misrepresenting what was said. This is exactly what was said. And the claimant also goes on to say that the key point is that Quraysh, like all, and you'll see why this is important in a minute, like all paganisms, ascribe to their gods power and the right to be worshipped. Their levels to power and worship. And that Quraysh, therefore, believed that their gods were semi-independent. And the other than the one supreme God. So there's the supreme God who they call the creator God. And all of the other gods also create, they have the ability to harm, they have the ability to benefit, and they act independently of Allah. Tell you, let, let's just make sure we get the claim down. So the claim, the claim is that the Quraysh believed in a creator God. That creator God is, what's his name? Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that they also believed that the other gods that they worshipped had the ability to create. They were capable of harming, capable of benefiting, and that they acted independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or semi-independently of Allah. But that Allah azza wa jal, they viewed him as being aloof and therefore these gods were closer to them and that is why they worship them. Tayyip. The claim is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, did not understand this. He did not understand the shirk of Quraysh. And therefore, the extreme Sufis of his time, the Rafida and others, he said that they were worse than the Kufar of Quraysh. And that's because he didn't understand the shirk of the Kufar of Quraysh. We clear on that? Because if he understood their shirk, then there's no way to say that these people, the, for example, the ones that are venerating their saints and invoking their, the deceased, okay, going to the graves and worshiping at the shrines. Okay, if he understood the shirk of Quraysh, he wouldn't have said that they, those people were, were worse than Quraysh. Now, because he said that they were worse than Quraysh, then that leads to, leads to point number two which is that that naturally creates a level of fanaticism and divisiveness. Because if those people are worse than the people that the Prophet Sallallahu fought, then naturally, then what should I be doing? I should be fighting them. And that led to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, killing tens of thousands of people. This is, in the, this is the claim. And thirdly, that nobody as we'll get to, inshallah, and this is the other claim that we'll deal with, that nobody before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab called certain acts shirk. That he exclusively was the one who called certain acts shirk, like al-istighatha bil amwat, which is to call upon the dead for aid, seeking aid from them. Okay? Now, again, we are not, inshallah, along the way we're going to learn a little bit more about the shirk that comes in the Quran. And what the scholars of Tafsir have said about that, 
and what the people before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab have said about that. Because the reality is, is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab died 229 years ago on the solar calendar, right? And a little bit more than that, 36, uh, 236 years ago, right, on the Hijri calendar. Which means that if you believe that same way, then you are simply a follower of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and your deen is mubtada. Mm. That, I mean, that is what's being said. That he was the one that innovated this. This was his understanding, not the scholars before. I'm not here to try to convince anybody to agree with any opinion. The issue here is that the claim that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, was the first one to say these things is simply a factual error. The scholars before him have said the same thing. Are there other scholars historically who have argued against certain opinions? Absolutely. And that's why the, the, the whole back and forth in the discourse, that's a totally different, that's a totally different issue. The issue here is, is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, is this claim correct? That he was the first to say that the shirk of Quraysh was primarily almost exclusively in Uluhiyya, okay, that they didn't do shirk in Rububiyya, or that they aqarru bil Rububiyya, that they affirmed the Rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tawheed al Rububiyya. And also that what? That all of the people, yani before, understood that the shirk of Quraysh, and other than Quraysh, because this is amongst the systems of pagans throughout humanity, that they all believed that their aliha, that their gods could benefit and harm and create independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are, are we clear on the claim? As a matter of fact, I'm not just going to ask you, are we clear? Bring back to me what the claim is. Yeah. They're saying that, they don't, that the people of Quraysh didn't only disbelieve in the Uluhiyya part, but they also disbelieve in the Uluhiyya Right, so they don't, they don't just make shirk in Uluhiyya, they also make shirk in Ar-Rububiyya. How do they make shirk in Rububiyya? Because they also, they believe that their gods, what? Benefit and harm, and they act independently of, or semi-independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. Okay? Tell you. Now, we're not just talking about uh, Quraysh, but we're talking about the, the kuffar umumen. Yeah, aqsud al-mushrikeen umumen. In general, the, the people of shirk. That Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was, did not understand this. And he was the, the first one to claim that their shirk was primarily in al-uluhiyya. Tell you. So, let us look at what Al-Baghawi uh, says in his tafsir. Now, Al-Baghawi died in 516, which was almost 700 years before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. 200 and some odd years before Ibn Taymiyyah. Okay? Al-Baghawi says, in dealing with these ayat, ayat from Surah Al-Shu'ara, what's the alayhim? Naba'a Ibrahim, إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, read to them, recite to them the news of Ibrahim. When he said to his father and his people, what are you worshipping? قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ أَصْنَامًا فَنَظَلُّ لَهَا عَاكِفِينَ They said that we are worshipping these idols and we are devoting ourselves to them. قَالَ هَلْ يَسْمَعُونَكُمْ إِذْ تَدْعُونَ أَوْ يَنْفَعُونَكُمْ أَوْ يَضُرُونَ So then Ibrahim said to them what? Do they hear you when you call upon them? Or do they benefit you or bring you harm or cause you any harm? قَالُوا بَلْ They said no. Hold on. What did he ask them? Do they hear? Do they cause us? Do they bring you any benefit? Do they cause you any harm? قَالُوا بَلْ وَجَدَنَا آبَاءَنَا كَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُونَ We found our forefathers doing this. So in other words, we're just doing it because? Because they were doing it. We're just doing it because they were doing it. Not that they actually believed that they could bring them harm or benefit. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. Tell you, what does 
Al-Baghwi say in his tafsir? He says, when Ibrahim is asking, do they hear you? It means, do they hear your dua when you make dua? When you call upon them, do they hear you? Ibn Abbas said, do they listen to you? Then Ibrahim says, or benefit you? It is said, qila bil rizq, and it has been said through sustenance. Oh, yadurrun, or harm you. If you were to leave their worship. They said no. But we found our forefathers doing so. This means they do not hear. This is what uh, Al-Baghawi says. This means they do not hear any statement or bring any benefit or repel any harm. However, we found the example of, we followed the examples of our fathers. He then goes on to say, And this refutes blind following in the religion. Mm. Here, and the bottom line is that this is Al-Baghawi clarifying the meaning of these ayat, which clearly show that there are some mushrikun, because the people of Ibrahim were mushrikun. We nasil Quran. I mean, this is from the text of the Quran that they were mushrikun. And what they did was called ibadah, even though they did not believe that these things caused them or that the, these idols could bring them any benefit or cause them any harm, especially independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let us look at tafsir al-Razi, which I'm not uh, recommending that. Uh, that anybody tries to read independently. Uh, Ar-Razi was from the biggest of the mutakallimin, the people of Ahlul Kalam. But the point here is even them, even the Asha'ira, even them, they did not say that the shirk of Quraysh was as was described by the claimant. And that's why it's very important for us also to understand. Does it mean that every mushrik on earth Believes the same thing? La. And this is the point that I, I think that is very important for us to understand. Right? Just like we have Muslims at different levels of Islam and Iman and Ihsan, the mushrikeen are also on a very broad spectrum. So some of them may believe that what they are worshipping brings them benefit and harm. And others don't. And it's all still shirk if they're doing acts of, of taqarru, if they're doing acts of devotion. A Razi in his tafsir uh, in explaining the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قُلْ مَنْ يَرْزُقُكُمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَمَّنْ يَمْلِكُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبَصَارِ وَمَنْ يُخْرِجُ الْحَيِّ مِنَ الْمَيِّتِ وَيُخْرِجُ الْمَيِّتَ مِنَ الْحَيِّ وَمَنْ يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرِ فَسَيَكُونُونَ اللَّهِ فَقُلْ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam to say to who? To Quraysh. Say to them. Who provides for you from heaven and earth? Or who controls, or from the skies and the earth? Or who controls hearing and sight? And brings the living out of the dead? And brings the dead out of the living? And who arranges every affair, every matter? They will say, Allah. They will say, Allah. So then say to them, will you not have taqwa? Will you not fear? Tayyip. Ar-Razi says, ثُمَّ بَيَّنَ تَعَالَىٰ إِنَّ الرَّسُولَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ إذا سألهم عن مدبري هذه الأحوال فسيقولون إنه الله سبحانه وتعالى. طيب. He says Allah made clear that if the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم were to ask them, يعني the Quraysh, who controls these matters, they would say that that it's Allah. وهذا يدل على أن المخاطبين بهذا الكلام كانوا يعرفون الله ويقرون به وهم الذين قالوا في عبادتهم الأصنام إنها تقربنا إلى الله زلفا. وَإِنَّهُمْ شُفَعَاؤُنَا إِنَّ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ هَذِيَ الْأَصْنَامِ لَا تَنْفَعُ وَلَا تَضُرُ وَكَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ هَذِيَ الْأَصْنَامِ لَا تَنْفَعُ وَلَا تَضُرُ he then, he then says, this indicates that those who were addressed with this speech, يعني, the Quraysh, they used to know Allah and affirm Him. They are the ones who said about their worshipping of idols, indeed they bring us closer to Allah. Why do we worship them? We worship them because they bring us closer to Allah. And they are our intercessors with Allah. And they knew that these idols did not benefit or harm. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab? La. 
No. He was 500 years after Ramsey. Or more. Afwan. More. 600 years after. He's the one who's saying here that they know that their idols do not benefit or harm. He then goes on to say, at this point, he said to his messenger, so I sent him, so say, so will you not then fear, meaning, so will you not fear making these idols partners with the law and worship, even though you admit that all good in this life and the hereafter only occurs from his mercy and his goodness? And you admit, وَاعْتِرَافُكُمْ بِأَنَّ هَذِهِ الْأَوْثَانِ لَا تَنْفَعُ وَلَا تَدُرُّ الْبَتَّةِ And you admit that these idols do not benefit or harm whatsoever. This is in the 17th volume, 91st page of Tafsir al-Razi. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, in explaining the ayat that come at the, towards the end of Surah Al-Mu'minun, قُلْ لِمَنِ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ قُلْ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ to the end of these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to say to them, لِمَنِ الْأَرْضِ وَمَنْ فِيهَا To who belongs the earth and everything that is in it. If you know, they are going to say it belongs to Allah. Say, أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ Will you not be mindful then? قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبْعِ Who is the Lord? of the seven heavens and the Lord of the great throne, they're going to say, this all belongs to Allah. Say, will you not then fear? Will you not have taqwa? Tayyip, Ibn Kathir. And again, we don't have time, I'm not gonna go through every single word. Just to highlight this point, Ibn Kathir said Allah is affirming his oneness and exclusivity and creation, control and dominion, to point to the fact that he is the only true deity and that worship is only befitting to him alone with no partner. This is why he told his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to say to the mushriks who worshipped others with Allah, those who affirmed Allah's lordship. Huh. The Ibn Kathir here says, "Al mu'tarifin lahu birububiyyah." They are admitting Allah's lordship and admitting that He has no partner in it. Yet they associate partners with Him in worship, which is al ilahiyah. So they worshiped others with him while admitting that those they worshiped did not create anything, did not own anything, or have exclusive control of anything. <laughs> Rather, they believe that they bring them closer to Allah, as Allah says in Surah Al-Zumar. <laughs> We do not worship them except that they may bring us closer to Allah. طيب. So Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, is also saying that the mushrikeen of Quraysh do what? That they affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyyah, but that their shirk is in what area? Uluhiyyah. طيب. He was, Ibn Kathir died in 774. So 430 some odd years before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Again, the claim that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was the first one to say this is simply not correct. Whether you agree with the conclusion or not, it's not correct to say that this is from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. طيب. This is from Majmu' al-Fatawa li Shaykh al-Islam al Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, 14th volume, 380th page. He says, with had tawheed, who al fariqu bayn al muwahideen wal mushrikeen? He's talking here about Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, that is the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. He says that this Tawheed is the thing that distinguishes between the Muwahideen, the people of Tawheed, and the Mushrikeen, the people of Shirk. And it is due to this Tawheed, it is surrounding this Tawheed that the reward in this life and the hereafter revolves around. Tayyip? Around this, which is Tawheed al Uluhiyah. For men, let me be he can, men and Mushrikin al Khalidi, and Allah la yal firu and Yushra kabi, wa yal firu maduna dari kali mayisha. And this is why it's so important to know well, what exactly is shirk? How do we avoid it? The big of the shirk, jali yuhu, yani wa khafiyu, that which is very open and that which may be more conspicuous and hidden. That which is major of the shirk and that which is lesser. It's important to know because whoever doesn't 
come with Tawheed, al uluhiyya then he will be from amongst the mushrikeen. Mm -hmm. Those who will abide in the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi. Because Allah does not forgive that partners be associated with him and he forgives other than that. That which he wills. He says, As for Tawheed al rububiyah not just rububiyah but Tawheed al rububiyah yani singling out Allah as the Rabb, فَقَدْ أَقَرَّ بِهِ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Then the mushrikeen uh, of Quraysh, they affirm that. They affirm Tawheed al rububiyah وَكَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ غَيْرَهُ And they used to worship others along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. Another statement from Shaykh al -Islam. We're going to wrap this part up and then you'll be able to ask some questions, inshaAllah ta'ala. طيب. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, says in Bayan, Talbis al-Jahmiyyah, first volume, page 514, he says, هَذَا بَيَانُ لِأَنَّ الْمُشْرِكِينَ يُقِرُّونَ بِأَنَّ مَلَكُوتَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لِلَّهِ يعني He brings the ayat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of which we've already read, قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبِعِ in whose hand is the dominion and the control of everything. Ibn Taymiyyah says this clarifies that the mushrikeen affirm that the malakut of everything belongs to Allah. What's malakut? What's it sound like? Like, like mulk, right? Tayyip. But there's a difference. And this is greater than mulk. Because the word malakut is more emphatic than the word mulk. Why? Mal mulk deals with, in general, especially when they come together, mulk and malakut. Malakut deals with what you can see and what you can't see. Even including the angels, all of that is considered to be from the malakut of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas the mulk is from his dominion, which you can see. I need the heavens and the earth and the planets and the, and the, and the stars. Okay, طيب. So here he says the point is that the mushrikeen even affirmed what the malakut for Allah subhanahu wa taala. It's all in His hand, tabaraka wa taala. طيب. This is the last uh, point that we'll make here to to deal with that first claim, which is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah did not understand the shirk of Quraysh, and that he was the first one to make that assertion that. Their shirk was primarily or exclusively in Al Uluhiyya. Ibn Qayyim, Rahimullah Ta'ala, our Shaykh, uh, for the last few books that we've covered, he says, Well, Ilahiya to let Ida at Rusulu, Umma Mahum Ila to Hid Rabbi Biha, he a libad to what Tetli, Women Lawazimi had to Hid Rubia, a lady a Karabi Hil Mushrikun, Fatajallahu Alehim Bihi, for in the Huyalism Men Al Ikrari Bihi. الإقرار بتوحيد الإلهية and this is found in the Iraqi to Lahfan the second volume page 135 he says the type of Tawheed that the messengers called their nations to single out Allah with is worship and deification from its necessities is Tawheed al rububiyah what's that mean from its necessities يعني if a person truly huh, embodies embodies الإلهية the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone then it's no doubt because they have reached a higher level in the Rububiyyah. And again, when we talk about the Mushrikeen, and all of the scholars who have talked about the Mushrikun affirming the Rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean that they were perfect in their affirmation. It doesn't mean that they didn't have major deficiencies in their affirmation of Rububiyyah. But it does mean that they akarru, they affirmed that the asal of a Rububiyyah was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's important because even a, a Muslim, who everybody would agree is a Muslim, if a Muslim disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is what they'll call that in the Quran, jahl, right? That's, that's ignorance. How, 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 how so? Why, why is it called jahala when a Muslim disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because they're doing it out of, without knowledge? Nah, nah. It, it, see, that's the point. It's not that they don't have knowledge. They underestimate the consequences. Maybe they underestimate some of the consequences. You want to say some shit? There's, there's, there's always going to be a level of ignorance attached to sin. Either you don't realize the gravity of what you're doing. Exactly. There's always a level of ignorance attached to sin. 
Either you don't realize the gravity of that sin you're doing, you don't realize the reward for leaving off that sin, you don't realize you're not being conscious of some of the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of that is part of Tawheed al marifa wal at the end of the day. Yani affirming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyya and his names and his attributes. There's some level of deficiency which led to you sinning. Okay? The, the, the point here though is that that does not mean that the person does not affirm a rububiyya for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It just means that there's deficiency. The mushrikun, without a doubt, had major deficiencies in rububiyya. If they did not, they would have been muwahidun. They would have been worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Tight. From its necessities, yani from the necessities, that which is a, let's just call it a natural consequence or naturally follows al ilahiyya is Tawheed al rububiyya which the mushriks affirmed for Allah. Tayyip. Ibn al-Qayyim said what? The mushriks affirmed what for Allah? al rububiyya al rububiyya Tawheed al rububiyya Hence, Allah uses it as evidence against them for affirming this necessitates affirming Tawheed al ilahiyya which is why... When we, if you, if you all recall, when we studied al ubudiyah Ya ayyuhal nas u'budu wa rabbakum, worship your Rabb, alladhi khalaqakum, who created you. And this is, if Allah is using this as a proof against them, you all admit that. You all admit that he's the Rabb. You all admit that he's your creator. Therefore, you should be worshiping him alone. Tell you, let's stop there. Any questions about this part so far? Yeah. Sometimes people have to know more. I'm not sure on my ignorance. Number one, uh, I just want to go over the basic. So what you're what you're saying is that uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimullah, is that he was the first. I, what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm kind of I'm a little bit confused. I'm not saying anything. About Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah. But they say he said, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, there, there is the claim that he is the first one to have said that the Quraysh, uh, that their shirk was primarily or exclusively in al uluhiyya And not in al And not in al-Rububiyyah. Where... Whereas the Quraysh believed, and all every mushrik believes A, B, C, and D, that they're gods, that, that what they're worshiping is a god that has the ability to create, that, that has the ability to harm, uh, bring you benefit, and act independently of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the claim. So, uh, I am simply trying to show that that is factually inaccurate. Argue the point all you want. We can, you know, you can bring, you know, tens of thousands of pages of books about the different uh, uh, philosophies of the mushrikeen of the past and the present and so forth, and and you can debate it out. Whatever. That's not really the issue here. The issue is I wanted for us to see what some of the scholars prior to Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab have said about the same issue. No. Okay. Well, coming from that, number two. Um I, it kind of blows my mind. It's obvious that Ibrahim no. and the people who were with were voicing that they don't believe that their idols help them, so they're just. I, 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 how do you get this mixed up? Allahu that's, Adam. that's that's. I, I don't know how to get it mixed up. <laughs> I don't. No, so I'm not, and I'm not trying to be funny. Um, I'm saying that I'm sure that there are other explanations, perhaps, that people come across. I mean, that's just the reality of, of the human mind sometimes that may interpret things differently than the way you and I interpret it. I, I, I'm not, I, I really do not want to deal, again, I don't want to deal with um, interpretation of texts. The, the point here is that many people are confused. They believe that the person who is speaking to them has done their homework, right? That the person who is speaking is responsible and that the information that they're relaying is accurate information. That Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is the first one that understood this this way. So the issue is to show, no, that's not the case. And it's very important for us to, to recognize that just like a person has the right to come if they genuinely believe something and they're prepared to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with what they say, and that they believe that that's correct and they want to teach people that, that 
They can do that. There's platforms for that. And likewise, they can be corrected when that information is factually inaccurate, which is what we're dealing with. We're, not, we're dealing with facts here. We're not dealing, I'm not, don't want to deal with, uh, it would take a, a whole lot longer to go into much more detail. Yes? I'm not, I, again, I don't want to deal with anything, any questions about what you already saw, the shirk, this aspect. Yeah. Tayyip, so the, the young man is asking, Tabarakallah, MashaAllah, Nasallah Azza wa Jalla, Yazidah kamil fadli, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase you in, in virtue. Uh, he said that there that there's three types of tawheed. Tawheed al-uluhiyya, al-rububiyya, and asma wa sifat, but I only mentioned two. Uh, the, classically, classically, the, the majority of the scholars have, have let's just say, if you will, lumped uh, uh, okay, which is to single out Allah as the Lord and al-asma wa sifat, which is to affirm his names and attributes. They put that together in one category because it's all a form of affirmation. It's all what I believe, right? Then what I do with that belief, because I believe that he's my Rabb and because I believe that he is a Samir, because I believe he's my Rabb, I worship him. Because I believe that he is a Samir, that he hears everything, then I call upon him. When things get rough and I watch what I say, right? Because I believe that he is al-basir, right? I know that there's nowhere I can go and disobey Allah and he's not going to see me, right? Because I know that he is at tawab then I turn to him in repentance when I do something wrong, right? And I know that he'll accept that repentance if I'm sincere in that repentance because he is at tawab and he is al-ghafur. So all of that, the, there are things that I know. Right. And then there are things that I do based off of what I know. So that's me. That that's the uluhiya part, which is to single him out in the worship, because I know these things. So that's why the, the that's that two categories. Tell you. They can they. Yes. They're under one category is called Tawheed al-Ma'rifa wal ithbat. Ma'rifa means to know. And it's bat means to affirm. So he of knowledge and affirmation. So he the mighty for what is bat. Tell you, I'm going to move on to this to the last claim. And then if there's any questions, we'll leave time at the end. Inshallah, Tell you, the the next claim uh, is that and th this is the last claim we're going to deal with is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, was the first to call certain acts shirk. Specifically, specifically, al istighatha bil amwat. Now, al istighatha, just so that we understand what that means. Um, I know that some of you know Arabic. So, what, have you heard of hayat al iratha? Al iratha, what's that mean? To rescue, right. To rescue, like when the ambulance comes, okay? Iratha. So it's al ist means what? Seek. To seek. So al istighatha is talabul ghawth or seeking rescue. Seeking. So usually we would probably translate that as seeking aid. Okay, but it it's usually at a, when there's a, when the situation is dire. Okay, so that's when you use al istighatha when something's really going going wrong. Okay, there's a dire situation. Tell So. Um, the, the, the claim is that uh, the, the Najdi theology, Najdism, Naj, you know, Muhammad ibn Dulhab was from an area in uh, an Arabian Peninsula called Najd, so they, some of them call his, uh, you know, his theology Najdism. That he is the uh, first one to say that al-istighatha bil amwat, yani seeking relief and rescue at dire times from those who are dead, deceased, or what might be called saint invocation and saint veneration. He's the first one to call this shirk, yani if it's divorced from the other uh, conditions that have been put in place. Meaning, what, and what are those conditions? 
The first is that the person has to intend that what they're doing is an act of ibadah. So if they say, no, this is not ibadah, then it doesn't count as shirk. Okay, this is what the person is claiming. And that the second thing is that they have to believe that the one that they are calling upon, okay, it has ta'thir, yani that they have power themselves, semi-independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if they don't believe that, if they don't believe that the one that they are doing an act of ibadah and that the one that they are calling upon is a god, then it is not shirk. And that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is the first one to come along. Now they will say that it's haram, that you shouldn't do it, it's bid'ah. But they're saying that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is the first one to call this shirk. Okay? Divorced of those shurut. Now, if those, if those are there, then everybody, all, all of the, everybody will call it shirk, right? If that person says, oh, yeah, I'm worshiping this one in the grave, right? Well, yeah, the billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. Tell you. So, this is the claim. The claim understood. You got the claim, Shaykh? The claim is that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is the first one to call this shirk without looking at the the other conditions that they mentioned. So with, no matter, even if the person says, no, nah, no, nah, I wasn't really, like, that's not ibad. Okay? And I don't believe that this person um, yani, acts independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right. Let's look at what Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala says. Remember this book here? Madarj al Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he begins in this particular section he's talking about uh, الشرك الأصغر he says فَكَيَسِيرُ الرِّيَاءِ وَتَصَنُّعُ لِلْخَلْقِ وَالْحَلِفِ بِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ كما ثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال من حلف بغير الله فقد أشرك وقول الرجل للرجل ما شاء الله وشت وهذا من الله ومنا to the end of what he just said he said وقد صح عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال لرجل قال له ما شاء الله وشت أجعلتني لله ندا كن ما شاء الله وحده وهذا اللفظ so he, he says, for, as for minor associationism or minor shirk, it includes the following, right? Which is yasir ar yani a minor uh, or a hint of showing off. Because if a person, the majority of what they do is riyat, then this actually is shirkun akbar, not shirk asghar. It's a major form of shirk. Taking an oath by someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet uh, said, whoever takes an oath by someone other than Allah, has indeed ashrak, has committed shirk, even though this is considered to be a minor form of shirk. Then other such statements. So he goes on to say, a sound report of the Prophet ﷺ, this is towards the end of the first paragraph. A sound report of the Prophet ﷺ says, a man said to him, Allahu wa shit, whatever Allah wills and what you will. The Prophet ﷺ responded to him, Ajaltani lillahi nidden, are you making me a rival to Allah? قُلْ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهِ Say whatever Allah alone wants. Whatever Allah alone wills. In other words, even the way that we speak, we have to be careful about our speech and that we don't fall into shirk in the speech. Not meaning that it's going to take a person outside of the fold of Islam. He said even though this wording is less objectionable than the other ones that preceded. Then he goes on to say, وَمِنْ أَنْوَاعِ الشِّرْكِ okay, Ibn Qayyim says, from the types of shirk, sujood al muridi li sheikh, fa innahu shirkun min al sajidi wal masjudi lahu wal ajabu annahum yakulu laysa hada sujoodan, wa inama huwa wadu al rasi kudam al sheikh, fa yukalu li haula, wa law sammaytumu ma sammaytumu, fa haqiqatu sujoodi wadu al rasi li man yushdadu lah, wa kadarika sujoodu li sanami wal shamsi wal najmi wal al hajri, kulluhu wadu al rasi kudam. He says another form of shirk is the prostration of a disciple to his master. For this is shirk from the one prostrating and the one being prostrated to. The strange thing is that they say, now listen, I want you to pay attention to this. Ibn Qayyim says, the strange thing is that they say, this is not sujood. It's just putting your head before the sheikh. Huh. It's not sujood. No, he's just putting his head down like that. Anyway, he says, it's said to them, you can call it whatever you wish. 
Name it whatever you want to name it. But the essence of prostration is what? To place one's head before the object of prostration. And the prostrations of the worshipers of idols, the sun, stars, and rocks all simply place their heads before them. This is what they're doing. So you can call it what you want. And this is why it's very important to note that Muhammad ibn Abdul Ahab is not the first one, even if we accept that claim, he's not the first one huh, to ignore what people call it. Oh, it's not Ibad. It's just uh, uh, whatever, they, whatever they call it. It's just Tawassul or it's just it's the, whatever they want to call it. It's not Ibad. So Ibn Al-Qayyim here is saying you can call it what you want. You put your head in front of something down on the ground. That's sujood. And that is a form of shirk. He said, and why shirk sujood al murid Next. It's going to get clearer and clearer as we go along, inshallah. I'm, going to, I'm just going to read this part in English. This is also from Shismu, Madaj Sadiqi. They have turned graves into idols that are worshipped, and they call these ventures pilgrimage. I mean, they make hajj to the graves. Anybody who knows, uh, you'll know that this is historically present in the ummah, okay? And it still exists today. Still exists until today, where people will not, they will save their money, they will not go to Hajj in Mecca, they will go make Hajj to another couple places where the graves are. They are given to visiting and shaving their heads there. Thus they have brought together in this one act, associating a partner with the true deity, altering his religion, opposing the people of Tawheed, and blaming them for failing to respect the dead. Because if you say, Ahi, don't, don't do that around the grave, then, then they come back and they say, you're disrespecting these awliya of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. While they fail to respect the creator by their shirk, as well as his allies who refuse to ascribe equals to him by blaming and faulting them and opposing them in hostility. Not only that, to the end of what he says, type. next paragraph, he says, none can be saved from this major shirk. Type. Yeah, and he, are they saying that the, the ones they're calling on is gods? They're not saying that. They're not saying that. They're not saying that they act independently of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet Ibn al-Qayyim is still calling it shirk. Again, Ikhwani, and I think this is important for us to understand. We're talking about the act, not the one who is doing the act. The one who's doing the act may be ignorant. And we'll talk about that in a minute, inshallah. But just be clear that it is what it is. This is still called shirk. Whether a person understands it to be that way or not. Shaykh al-Islam and al-Ikhna'iyya says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, page 206, Whoever calls upon other than Allah, Al-Istighatha is a type of calling upon other than, well, Istighatha to the Amwat, to the, those who have deceased. This is a type of calling upon other than Allah. He says, whoever calls upon other than Allah or performs Hajj to other than Allah is a Mushrik. What he has done is Kufr. Tayyip. Shaykh al-Islam died 480 years before Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Clear? And the, the, the one who's making the claim about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab makes it a point to say that he is a Taymiyyan in his framework, that he agrees, and not with everything and that Shaykh al-Islam says, but that you know, he's been reading Shaykh al-Islam for the last 25 years. And this is very important, that if that's the case, what do we do with these things that Shaykh al-Islam has said? If, in fact, we're saying that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was the first one to call these things shirk. طيب. He says, Rahimahullah, كما, نعم, قال ولكن قد لا يكون عالما بأن هذا شرك محرم. However, he may not be aware that this is prohibited shirk. يعني, okay. So, it is shirk whether the person is aware or not. This is what Shaykh al-Islam is saying, Ibn Taymiyyah. Whether he intends for it to be an act of worship or not, يعني, that does not seem to be a factor in determining that the act itself is shirk. 
He goes on to say, كَمَا أَنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ دَخَلُوا فِي الْإِسْنَيْنِ مِنَ التَّتَارِ وَغَيْرِهِمْ وَعِنْدُهُمْ أَصْنَامٌ لَهُمْ صِغَارٌ مِنْ لُبَدٍ وَغَيْرِهِ أَوْ لَبِدٍ وَهُمْ, يتف... وهم يَتَقَرَّبُونِ إِلَيْهَا وَيُعَذِّمُونَهَا وَلَا يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّ ذَلِكَ مُحَرُّمٌ فِي دِينِ الْإِسْلَامِ ويتقربون إلى النار أيضا ولا يعلمون أن ذلك محرم فكثير من أنواع الشرك قد يخفى على بعض من دخل في الإسلام ولا يعلم أنه شرك فهذا ضال وعمله الذي أشرك فيه باطل لكن لا يستحق الكوبة حتى تقوم عليه الحجة to the end of what he's saying here so what he says is this was the case of many of the Tatar and others who accepted Islam they had small idols made out of wool and other than wool, and they used them to draw closer, yani they used to do acts of devotion to them, and they would venerate them or, or hold them in high esteem, and they didn't know that this is haram in the deen of Islam. And they would also do acts of devotion to the fire, yani like fire worship, but they didn't know that it was haram. So many of the types of shirk, qad yakhfa ala ba'd, it may be, uh, una, yani the people who have entered Islam, may be unaware and not know that it is shirk. He said, this one is dal. This person is astray. And his action, and what he has done of shirk is batil, right? But he does not deserve to be punished until the proof is established. Shaykh al-Islam also says in Qa'id al-Jaleel, on page 231 and 232, the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited taking graves as masjids and he cursed the people who did so or do so to warn from imitating them. Yani that is to warn from imitating the people who worship graves. For that is the foundation of idol worship. In general, across the board, the asal of shirk is, is two. The worship of the graves and the worship of the planets and the stars. Uh, yani that's historically accurate. Not just from the Muslims, but even other anthropologists and others who, who, who study human history, they talk about where shirk has come from. Two different angles. Worshipping the graves, like the people of Nuh, yani after him. Uh, and, and this is what he's talking about here. Type. He says, but that is the foundation of idol worship. Shaykh al-Islam goes on to say, shirk. He says, that which the Prophet sallallahu forbade, or may, or yes, from this type of shirk, huwa kadharika fi shara'i ghayrihi min al-anbiya, is also in the shari'as of other prophets. Right? It's not just from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qalib fi al-Tawrah anna Musa alayhi wa sallam naha bani Israel an dua al-amwati wa ghayri dharika min al-shirk. He said because it comes in the Tawrah that Musa forbade bani Israel from invoking the deceased. Huh? and other forms of shirk. Therefore, invoking the deceased, according to Shaykh al-Islam, is a form of shirk. And then here's a, a longer quote from, uh, from the same book, Qa'id al on page 233, where he goes in and also says something similar. We're going to skip for the sake of time. Tayyip. Shaykh al-Islam in Jamin Masail, page 145. This is the third majmu'ah. Um, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala says, Whoever seeks aid from one who is deceased or absent, such that he supplicates to him during difficulties and times of hardship, and asks from him the fulfillment of his needs. فَيَقُولُ يَا سَيِّدِي الشَّيْخِ فُلَانِ أَنَا فِي حَسْبِكْ وَجِوَارِكْ أَوْ يَقُولُ عِنْدَ هُجُومُ الْعَدُوِ عَلَيَّ سَيِّدِي فُلَانِ Okay, to the end of what he says. And he asks from him the fulfillment of his needs. So he says, oh, my master so-and-so, I am in your protection. Or he says when the enemy attacks him, oh, master so-and-so, he's seeking his help and the aid and removing the hardship. Or he says this when he is sick or poor, he needs other things. This person, Shaykh al-Islam says, is misguided. He's ignorant. He's a mushrik and disobedient to Allah by the agreement of the Muslims. For they are in agreement that the dead, yani, that deceased person, whether he is a prophet, a sheikh, or anyone else, is not invoked or asked for anything. Tayyip. He goes on. Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah. Ta'ala says, فَلِهَادَ قَالَ الْعُلَمَاءَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنَّهُمْ إِنَّهُ يَحْرُمُ بِنَاءُ الْمَسَاجِدِ عَلَى الْكُبُورِ فَإِذَا كَانَ كُبُورُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ لَمْ تُتَّخِذْ مَسَاجِدِ وَالصَّلَاةُ عِنْدَهَا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَ قَدْ نَهَا عَنْهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لِأَلَّا تَكُونَ ذِرِيعَةً إِلَى الشِّرْكِ فَكَيْفَ إِذَا كَانَ صَاحِبُ الْقَبْرِ يُدْعَى وَيُسْأَلُ وَيُقْسَمُ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِهِ وَيُشْتَدُ لِقَبْرِهِ أَوْ يُتَمَسَّحُ بِهِ فَإِنَّ هَذَا شِرْكٌ صَرِيحٌ إِنَّ هَذَا شِرْكٌ صَرِيحٌ 
The scholars said, this is what Sheikh Sam says, it is haram to build masjids on graves. If the graves of prophets and the righteous are not to be taken as masjids, and if the prophet, in fact, prohibited praying to Allah at the graves so that it would not be a stepping stone to shirk. Yani, in other words, we're not supposed to pray at the graves. In fact, even the janazah, which we're sometimes forced to pray at the grave, right, because of COVID regulations and those things right now, there are all the matters say that you cannot do that. It's haram to pray at the grave. I mean, there are scholars who say that. I, 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 I Meaning salat al janazah. And the regular salat, then, then no doubt about it. I mean, that's what the nus of the Prophet ﷺ and his hadith says. So, in fact, prohibited praying to Allah at the graves. Why? So that it won't be a stepping stone to shirk. Because the usul of idol worship goes back to what? The Worshipping the deceased. That saint worship. Those who are in their graves. So don't even pray it. Then what about when the one in the grave is being invoked and asked? Swearing to Allah by him. And when prostration is being made to his grave, or it's being wiped for blessing, this is clear-cut shirk. This is what Shaykh Sam said. Without going into a whole bunch of, uh, you need this condition and that condition and this condition, it's shirk. This is what he says. This is very similar um, here, similar statement, page 151 of the same book. قَالَ وَهَذَا الشِّرْكِ إِذَا قَامَتْ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ الْحُجَّةِ فيه ولم ينته وجب قتله كقتل أمثاله من المشركين ولم يدفن في مقابر المسلمين ولم يصلى عليه وما إذا كان جاهلا لم يبلغ العلم ولم يعرف حقيقة الشرك الذي قاتل عليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم المشركين فإنه لا يحكم بكفره ولا سيما قد كثر هذا الشرك في المنتسبين إلى الإسلام. I just want to point out this one point because it's going to get difficult. I'm going to have to do a lot of disclaimers if I train, translate this. يعني the 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 issue here. Is that Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, is saying here that if a person is jahil and he doesn't know that this is shirk, yani, then he's not to be punished, like he said earlier, until the proof has been established. He says, especially shirk fil al-Islam. Especially because this shirk has become much uh, amongst the people who ascribe themselves to Islam. Yani, that they call themselves Muslims, but it's still happening. Tayyip, wrapping up now, inshallah. All right. This is something similar uh, in Majmu'a Fatawa, uh, the 11th volume, page 662 to 663. You can go back and look at it for yourself. Basically, Shaykh al-Islam says here, it's shirk for someone to invoke other than Allah, such as the one who seeks aid during times of fear, sickness, and poverty from the dead and from the absent. When he says the absent, he means that a person is in one land and they're calling upon some sheikh that might be alive in another land because he believes that that sheikh can hear him and answer his, his dua. He says, one says, for example, my master, sheikh so-and-so, to a dead or absent sheikh, he seeks aid from him, goodness from him, and he asks him what is asked of Allah, such as victory and help. This is from the shirk that Allah and his messenger have forbidden by the agreement of the Muslims. Again, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab was not the first one to say that. Sheikh Rasam goes on to say, among them are those who request from the deceased. This is in his book, Al-Qaeda, I mean, Qaeda to Nazima, Fi Al-Farqi, Bayna Ibadati Ahl al-Islam, Wal Iman, Wa Ibadati Ahl al-Shirki, Wa Nifaq. Tayyip. This is also a Majmur of a Tawa. In any event, he says, among them are those who request from the deceased that which is requested from Allah, saying, Forgive me, provide for me, aid, for, aid me, etc. Someone would ask Allah for this in Salat and other similar matters that no one who knows Islam with doubt is contrary to the deen of all of the messengers, for it is surely from the shirk that Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa have forbidden. And there's much more that can be said about all of these. I'm going to skip this one, even though it's very strong. Um, when Shaykh al-Islam says, it is clear shirk, even if it is at the grave of a prophet or a righteous person. Uh, and this is in volume 27 of Majmur Fatawa, page 72. We're going to end with this slide here, inshallah ta'ala, and then... Uh, if there are any questions, we'll take them. Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, وَلِهَادَ كَانَ مِنْ أَتْبَعِ هَؤُلَى مَنْ يَشْجُدُ لِلشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ وَالْقَوَاكِبِ وَيَدْعُوهَا كَمَا يَدْعُوا اللَّهِ تَعَالَى If you didn't listen to anything else, I want you to understand this. He says, from amongst their followers. Now, their followers. Who is he talking about here? Uh, apparently, wallahu ta'ala adam, uh, he's talking about the falasifa al muntasibina Islam. So there are philosophers who, um, the early philosophers like Ibn Sina and so forth, who ascribed to Islam. I mean, they, they, they said that they were Muslims. Right? He says that from their followers are those who 
uh, prostrate to the sun, to the moon, to planets. And they invoke them like they invoke Allah. And they fast for them and perform pilgrimage for them and they do acts of devotion to them. Listen to this. Then they say, This is not shirk. They would then say, this is not shirk. Shirk is only if I believe that they are in control of me. See that condition that we're talking about? That they have this control. But if I only make it like a means, right? And an intercessor, I am not a mushrik. However, it is known by necessity from the deen of Islam that this is shirk. There are other slides. However, um, I know that I've gone 14 minutes over my time. Uh, but I wanted to deal with this so that we don't have to go on this journey again, not like this. Um, that we can stick to this book, which is taking us on that journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, so that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone the way that the Prophet sallallahu worshipped Allah. Yani even no matter what way we feel about this or we come to the same conclusions, that ah, oh, this person should be or shouldn't be or to the end of the Prophet taught us to call upon Allah. If you look at all of the adhkar al-sabah, adhkar al-masa, adhkar qabl al-nom, what you say in the morning and in the evening and before you go to sleep and to the end of all of it starts off with what? Allahumma, Allahumma, or Rabbi, oh Allah, or Rabbi. We were not taught to call upon anybody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is not to, uh, much more could be said about the topic. But when information goes out and it's confusing and people believe that, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, Muhammad of Abdul, I have this. And then people just start, well, I, uh, please stick to beneficial knowledge. A lot, again, a lot of these social media platforms, it's just people talking and talking and talking. Stick to the knowledge. Go back to the books. Study your deen. Draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Call upon Allah. And take your deen from the Rabbaniyin. Those people who are teaching the Sigar al-ilm, Qabla Kibarihi, they're teaching the small issues before the big issues. They're, they're, they're taking you back to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. And doing their best to bring the interpretation of the campaigns of the Messenger وسلم, and those who came after them. And just as an example, in the last class that you heard, when Sheikh Hanif was bringing those ahadith from Sahih Muslim, and then that ended with the athar of Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to say that what? That the people who were not coming to the masjid at the time of the Messenger وسلم, yatakhallaf an salati fil jama'ah and were staying away from the congregation Nobody did that except for what? A munafiq, ma'loom, and nifaq, a hypocrite who was known to be known by everybody else to be a, a hypocrite. But that was the understanding of the companions for those statements of the Prophet. Again, it's very important yani, that we take our deen back. And uh, we didn't do that here in terms of going back. Okay, uh, yeah, we started off with some of the ayat from the Quran. Uh, and some statements from the Prophet ﷺ, but the point here was not to do a foundational class on ibadah and shirk and tawheed and sunnah. But we have to realize that this is a very fundamental aspect of our deen. We should never belittle it. We should, we should never look down on the people who are teaching other people the basics of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Any, any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Like a part of the argument is, it's not sure if they don't believe that this is a God. Yeah. You said they don't believe it's a God. Right. I mean, you're making a... Yes. Any, any questions about this? Yes. It, it, it seems like one of the problems is what oftentimes people who 
who try to defend what they do, that they fall into the same thing, which is talking about what's in people's hearts. Yes. Like a part of the argument is, it's not sure if they don't believe that this is a God. You yes. said they don't believe it's a God. Right. I mean, you're making a huge assumption. All we can do is that is, is just by his action. Right. So uh, that that's a part of the argument. So there were many claims that, that have been made. The, the issue here is not to go through claim after claim after claim. It's, it's no point in going back and forth through video. Um, that's, that's not really the issue. The issue is to establish that certain things are just simply factual errors. Now, when we get into the claims of, well, who said that they don't believe that the one they're calling upon is God? If you look back at the books of the Rafila and the, and the extreme, well, that's the Sufi. If you look back at their books, the powers that they give to the ones that they are calling is, is enormous. As they said, what's left for Allah? Spend time. If you've given all of that to this person or that person or this Qutb or whatever. Yani, so when you actually go back to their books and you, and you see what they, what they themselves say they believe in, then, then, it, it, you know, then that actually answers a lot of the questions. Tell you, uh, again, um, you know, I, I felt like this is not a waste of time to spend some time to go into just a little bit deeper about some of these issues related to ship. Inshallah ta'ala next week. We'll get back on track and we'll start with chapter 3, which is the migration to the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wa salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us with Islam and to protect our Islam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us with Islam and with faith, with Iman. We ask Allah azza wa jal to give us the good of this life and the good of the next life and to save us from the punishment of the fire. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, shahadu wa la ilaha illa anta staghfiru kawa tu ilayhi. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته